Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to see all of you here today, especially those who are here visiting or haven't seen you for a long time. We welcome you back and we would like to get to know you better or catch up with you after this. So we are in the season of Lent. Um, next week is our Palm Sunday and the following week is the Holy Week. So I do want to encourage you to take time as uh, uh, we prepare ourselves towards commemorating the death and also celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Um, as Ipui mentioned, we will be having a six days fasting and prayer. So it starts on the following Monday, not tomorrow, but the following Monday to Saturday. And as a church, we want to come together. We want to learn how to fast and seek God and pray and to um, also learn how to put away something that is dear to us, actually dying to our flesh, dying to ourselves. And as we do that, we are honouring God and we are intentionally making more time and learning how to be in tune with the Spirit, with God, the Holy Spirit, you know, dying to our flesh and meditating on His Word. So if you're going through a, a season of questions and doubts, um, take time to fast and pray and seek the Lord for His answers. If you're going through some challenges, Take time to fast and pray for the Lord to give you direction, for the Lord to give you strength to do what He wants you to do. If your spiritual life has been dry, then it is time to come back to the Lord. It is time to fast, to pray, that He will renew you, that He will fill you afresh with His Holy Spirit, that you will be filled with His joy, the joy of salvation once again. And if you have nothing particular to fast for, that's also good, but still come and join us and fast and pray because it is a time where we learn how to grow in our love, our devotion towards Christ, okay? So today we will continue with our series on First Peter. Um, before we go there, uh, let's just commit this time to the Lord. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, that it is you who have done everything. It is you who have saved us. It is you who has loved us first. And even if, as we are in this time of land, in this season of land, sometimes we don't remember what it is all about, that it is about you dying on the cross. It is you who have given your life and you have given us a life with you. And even as we look at this part of scripture, Lord, of how to live our lives in this world, we pray that you help us remember that it is never about what we can do, but it is always the Holy Spirit who is helping us because what you have done on the cross. So we commit this time into your hands, Lord. Speak to each of us. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and work in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just a short recap before we go to the scripture. So Peter is speaking to the early church who were going through hardship due to persecution, um, because they have this newfound faith in Christ. So being aware of this hot hospitality that they face, what Peter does is he reminded them of their identity. So they, the church, and we, the church now, we are exiles and we, we are aliens of this temporary world. So our citizenship is in the kingdom of God. This is just temporary. And our hope is not in the comfort of this world or what we gain out of this world but in the future inheritance that we will receive when we spend eternity with Christ, okay? And then we are reminded that the trials that we face, although they are unjust, they purify our faith. Um, it gets rid of all the things that entangles us with this world, with sin, and it hin anything that hinders us from our devotion towards Christ. So trials does that. It helps us purify and make our faith more genuine. And as Christ purifies us, we are commanded to be holy because our Father, God, is holy. So despite what the world does, we are called to be and to act like God. And then Peter reminds us that we shouldn't be surprised that there is persecution, that we are facing hostility from the world. Because Jesus, the living stone, our master, he was chosen by God, but he was rejected by men. He faced persecution and hostility despite being the son of God himself. So as his followers, we will face persecution. We will face hostility from the world. And just as persecution did not change 
the identity of Jesus. He knew who he was, you know. He came to save the world. He was very clear with his mission. So our circumstances around us, it doesn't change who we are, our identity, our calling in Christ. We are still his chosen people. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are God's treasured possessions. So these are actually names that God gave the nation Israel in the Old Testament. And now it is given to us Christians, the new Israel. So our purpose, our calling is ultimately to live for God, to be his ambassadors in this broken, this sinful world and to glorify him. And then finally, Peter gave guidelines on how to live out our calling, our purpose in this world that is hostile to us. So we have looked at how to live under unjust government or leadership. We look at how uh, to work under terrible or mean bosses, uh, mean masters. Um, and then we look at how to live with an unbelieving or ungodly spouse. So what, what it says is instead of reacting you know, um, uh, aggressively in retaliation, uh, the Christian response, we all... What we should do is to gently submit with grace. We are called to embrace suffering. We are called to patiently endure hardship in a way that resembles Christ. So the gospel we know is that God shows his goodness and, he to, uh, and his love to undeserving sinners. So his kindness was meant to lead us towards repentance. So as Christians, we are to imitate our Lord in repaying those who mistreat us with blessing them sharing God's love and goodness. So today we are summing this up and learning how to respond hostility with kindness. So our text is taken from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 12, and the title is Repay Evil with Blessing. So I'll just read for you. Verse 8, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So I remember when I was younger, there was a time where whenever you have a problem, people would just ask you to pray about it. If you have a financial difficulty, pray for God to provide. If you have a health issue, pray for healing. If you are struggling in the workplace, pray for God to remove that person or the thing that is giving the problem. And none of this prayer is wrong, but it, what it often contributed is our assumption that God is supposed to solve your problem when you have a problem and when you pray. So if your problem doesn't go away, it is because something is wrong with you or you are not praying enough. You're not praying in the right way, you're not, or, or you are living in sin, etc. So people don't really talk about the reality of that. It may not be God's will to actually remove you from a difficult situation. You know, we know that suffering is unpleasant, and suffering is a product of the fall, the sin of mankind. But the reality of suffering is that it is now part of a life in this side of the world, this imperfect, this broken world. And this is not the end of the story. We know that pain does not have the last say. Um, in, uh, when Jesus comes back, it will be completely eradicated as sin will be. Um, but it also doesn't mean that we just have to wait hopelessly towards that day when Christ comes. What we are called to is to recognize that because sin is here, suffering is here, and we can embrace suffering like Jesus. And we can, as we learn to do that, we will begin to see, to witness how God can actually use suffering, hostility, persecution, to bring about His purpose, His will in our lives and through, the lives of, um, uh, through our lives towards the people around us. And here in this episode, 
Peter is saying that, you know, he does not say that pray and then God will deliver you from your oppressors. Pray and then God will remove your persecution. God will make your life easier. What Peter tells us is this truth that nobody likes to hear. Pray, God may not save you from the hostile environment that you are in, but He is with you. He knows what you're going through. He will give you what you need to go through this. And He will help you each step of the way. And this is what we need to remember and embrace. And on the other side, we need to be consciously aware that as we continue to live in this world, the hostility continues and it will affect us. You know, the hostility that we face, the temptation that we face, it impacts us. The world that we live in impacts us. It changes our heart. It changes our affections. It changes our appetites. It changes our mind, our definitions of things, our sense of value, our sense of worth. So it changes us. You know, from the pre previous passage, we, we have come to terms that no government is perfect. So when the leaders of the country have selfish agendas, when they are corrupted, when they are uninterested to care and serve the people, we suffer injustice and it changes us. And same with the workplace, you know. Most people in the workplace, their intention is to secure positions, to secure power, to have money, to have success for themselves. So when people is focused on that and they use each other to climb the ladder, and there are many terrible bosses out there, when we are in such environments, we will get affected. In the homes, when one of our, uh, the spouse is unbelieving or doesn't practice godliness, it does create a lot of conflict within the family. And this also affects us. So all of us, unless you live completely isolated from people, we will be part of hostile environments. No one is exempted. And it's not always easy to do the right things when we are receiving such hostility. And it does affect us. So the question is, how does this hostility around us affect us? Have you thought about these questions? If yes, you know, how are you addressing it? How are you allowing God to change that? If not, why are you not thinking about it? If we do not constantly think about these things, we will actually be unconsciously affected by it even more. So don't underestimate the influence of the world and its impact on us. So Peter in verse 8, he says, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. So Peter was addressing two different groups of people um, in the previous passage. But here, in this, here he sums it up and speaks to everybody, and he was speaking to the church. So he says, don't become like the world. Don't do to each other what the world is doing to you. The world is hostile to you. You don't be hostile to each other. In fact, as you face hostility from the world, when you go through hardship, what you need is a godly community that becomes your support. And in this community, you will need to do these things for each other. So be like-minded to remember who you are. You are saved by Jesus. You are one body under His Lordship. Constantly meditate upon God's word so that it grounds you in this same vision to be Christ-like, to do what is right. So don't fight with one another. Don't compete. Don't slander. Don't instigate disunity. It's not about loyalty towards a particular human being, but be united in our loyalty towards Christ. And be sympathetic. Learn to listen to one another's story. Learn to understand and put your shoes, put your feet in the other person's shoes. Learn to be interested in other people's life. Learn to share about your life with one another. Because the church is a place where his people can be vulnerable with one another because there is no condemnation. And love one another. This is so important because God's love is so often showed through his people. So you allow God's love to fill us and overflow through our lives. Accept each other with the differences that we have 
the flaws, the mistakes that we have. Forgive those who have done wrong to you, to who have hurt you. And serve that person selflessly. Put their needs above ours. Cheer each other. Encourage one another. And support one another. Pray for each other. Then be compassionate. Show genuine care towards each other. Allow what the other person is going through to affect you. Because you care so much for that person that if the person is rejoicing, you are rejoicing. The person is grieving, you are grieving. Be vulnerable, be thoughtful, be kind. Be willing to sit down with a person to talk. Be willing to walk with those who are hurting. Be willing to do for the other person even if it's going to cost you. And be humble. Don't be prideful. Don't be self-righteous to look down on people. Be teachable to correction and to recognize that not everything is about us. So when you look at these five things and when we have a community that treats each other with such virtues, it becomes a lifeline, a blessing when we are drowned, when we are facing the hostility of the world. So the church becomes a place where we can come and we can be loved and we can be recharged by the word of God and the fellowship of the saints. And it gives us power, gives us strength, gives us the ability to go out and face the world the way that Christ has called us to. So most of you know, even just now, Ipoy was uh, praying for uh, the ministry that we, we, we have been going to Desa Mandari every week for community work. So we teach English there and we teach character there to a group of uh, students who are uh, uh, young. Okay? So the more we go there, the more we are discovering the brokenness of the community. You know, sometimes the things that the children go through at a, such a young age, thinking about these things keeps me awake in the middle of the night. You know, thinking about how suffering is so real to them at this age and thinking about how we are supposed to help them. And it is tempting to think that the solution is to actually remove them from this uh, situation that they are in. Perhaps then that will you know, save them from, uh, or solve their problems. But that is not it. What we need to learn to do is to help them face those challenges that they are in. Their hardship, learning to overcome certain habits, certain things, working out their emotions. And of course, the most important thing is actually to eventually tell them that they need God. So when we meet them, our goal is to help them remember that this is a place that they can learn, where they know that they are not condemned. And they know that we all care for them. And our prayer is they slowly, which we are seeing bit by bit, that they will feel comfortable to share with us what they are going through. And we are able to pray with them, walk with them, and teach them how to, to in this journey, eventually introduce God's love to them. And this, this idea is not only for them. This is the calling for the church. This is what the church is for, for one another. All of us face different kinds of hardship. We may struggle with workplace stress. You know, there's always conflicts, there's always politics in the workplace. We may be struggling for caring out for our elderly parents. Sometimes it's not as easy. Sometimes it drains us. Some of our parents are not even Christians and it gets difficult. We may be struggling with our studies. We may be struggling with low self-esteem with the insecurities that we have. We may be struggling with an, an uninvolved or angry spouse or uninvolved and angry parents at home. So as we come here every week, as we have relationship with one another and we keep in touch during the week, we have a community to help us face these struggles that we have. And what we need to do is we have to keep working on building the church towards this godly community that is a safe haven to everybody. So we come, we receive this love, this blessing from one another, and we come and we bless each other by doing all these things for the other person. And then in verse 9, Paul, uh, Peter says, 
Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. So earlier I mentioned we shouldn't underestimate the power of this world that has on us. So when we receive hostility, it can cause us to react in hostility or it can cause us to go into despair. It is only human that when you continuously face a challenge, a hostility, you do get tired, you do get frustrated, you will become weary, you will become angry, and etc. And the question is, what happens if we don't address it? When we just leave it as it is, when we bury it, we can become people who run away from any kind of stress because we do not want to learn to handle anything difficult. So then, when God actually calls us to do something that is out of our comfort zone, we refuse because we have not addressed our issues. And we can become people who are cynical towards others. We judge very quickly. We decide who we want to let into our lives and who's going to stay out. We can become indifferent towards people. We are not interested to get to know people. We just want to do our things the way we have done it all these years. You know, we come, we do our things, we go. And we can become parents who have no energy after we come back from work. Because the stress in the workplace is tiring. It drains everything that we've got. And even though we are at home with the family, we may not be present for them, for our family, our children. Or worse still, sometimes we lash out on the children, on our spouses. And we can become very angry all the time. People don't like to be around us. People are afraid, so they avoid us. And when people are around us, they have to walk on eggshells. And we can also become people who have given up on our situation, you know, on our marriage, on our spouse, on our children, on the ministry, on the church. We think that this is life. This is what it is. So no point doing anything because nothing is going to change. And we can become people who are still complaining about the same things that other people have done to us after 10 years. You know, those people may not even be in our lives anymore, but we still hold on to what has happened. So when we don't address the effects of the hardship that, that we face, we can be consumed by it. And we can be filled with unforgiveness, anger, and bitterness. And what happens is our life becomes without joy, it becomes lifeless. We do not know how to enjoy life and enjoy people anymore. And so we avoid everything that everyone and everyone that makes us feel uncomfortable, which happens to be a lot of things. And then what happens is we become lonely, we isolate ourselves. And you may ask, is it possible to enjoy life when you are actually facing hardship? In the next verse, Peter quotes from Psalms 34. And he starts with this. He says in verse 10, For whoever would love life and see good days. And this is definition of enjoying life. So Peter is saying, yes, it is possible to enjoy life when you are facing hostility. Even the kind that the early church was facing. You know, the persecution that they were facing to the extent that some of them are in the risk of martyrdom, of dying. And you still can enjoy life. So the point is, it is not our circumstances that consumes us, that takes away life from us. But it is actually our bitterness. It is actually how we react to it. What we are holding on to that takes the joy out of our life. So it is bitterness that consumes us. It is when we don't allow God to change that part of us that consumes us. So don't underestimate how bitterness can fester if it is not dealt with quickly. So reading the, the whole verse says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. So bitterness affects the way we talk and we think. We become negative, we become a pessimist, we are judgmental, we are cynical, and generally we are just hopeless about things. 
So when you listen to two person, two people talk about the same subject, one of them a bitter person and the other is uh, not, it is very obvious the, the differences, you can hear it. The bitter person is always negative, while the other person is excited, he's passionate, he's hopeful, he's interested in working things out. And when you are given a project in the office, in the school, in the ministry, the bitter person will always complain how difficult it is, how inconvenient, how impossible, it's not going to work. But the other person is excited, is hopeful. They are aware of the challenges, but they focus on the possibilities, the solutions to make things better of what God is doing. And the bitter person always look down on others. They like to criticize the way other people do things, especially when people are not doing things the way that they do, and they will find fault. Well, the, the person who is free from bitterness, they are willing to help. They are willing to invest into people's life. They are willing to empower people. They are gracious when people make mistakes and they teach them. And then the bitter person is often very petty about little things and they pick on them. They focus on the problems. Well, the others celebrate the good things that God is doing. They focus on the solutions to the challenge. And what is also dangerous is when we become bitter towards a certain person, we are often hold on to a negative perception on that person that is difficult to change until we decide to do something because we are blinded by our bitterness. So what happens is we, we sometimes wait for the person to make mistake, to fail, and then we will point it out. And sometimes no matter how hard that person try, the person is not going to be good enough until they meet our expectations, until they do things the way we want them to do. So we become cynical. We, we become self-righteous. We become unfair to that person. And the, the danger of it is, it manifests in the way we talk, the way we think, the way we do things. And it will be picked out by other people as well. And when we talk to each other that way, it becomes contagious. You know, this kind of talks can feed on each other's negativity and it makes us more bitter and more um, unwilling to change our perception. So when, you, when the Israelites, when they were delivered from Egypt in the, and they were in the wilderness, they started complaining and grumbling among themselves. And before they knew it, the whole community became angry with Moses for bringing them out of Egypt. So they lost sight of God's deliverance in their life. They lost sight of God's goodness. And they wanted to actually go back to Egypt, to enslavement. And this is the power of bitterness. This is the power of negativity when it's not dealt with. It is contagious. It can bring down the whole community. And then, you know, before the Israelites enter the, to Canaan, 12 spies went. 10 spies said that it was impossible. Well, two remembered God's deliverance and put their trust in God's ability to bring them into victory. But once again, they listened to the ten spies and the Israelites were, were, were afraid. So they, they did not possess the land. It cost them a lot. So I'm not saying that we cannot talk to each other about our frustrations and our anger. You know, as a godly community, we saw just now, we should be able to be vulnerable to share with one another. But what we should learn to do is we must be mature enough to help each other not to dwell in that negativity, not to dwell in the anger, in that hurt, in that bitterness. We have to grow. We have to move forward. We have to learn to let go and forgive. And we have to actually learn to see what God actually wants us to do. So we need people to listen to us, yes, but especially people who hold us accountable, people who will pull us out from our pit, people who will tell us when we are wrong, people who will rebuke us when we're not listening. And just as bitterness is contagious, joy and love is also contagious. So if our talks is filled with God's truth, even when we are talk, telling about our frustrations, we can feed on each other's 
excitement, joy, hope in God, passion, our security in God. This can be contagious towards one another. You know, when Nehemiah led the exiles built in, the, in building the wall, the people were surrounded by fierce threats on them day and night. You know, the people, did, the people around didn't like what they were doing. But Nehemiah, who was their leader, he was convicted that this is the Lord's work. And he set an example and he managed to convince the exiles to continue the work of the Lord. And that is also the power of influence when we are able to encourage one another that way. So let, let us be like Nehemiah, who will heal from God, who will be convicted by God and let our convictions influence one another, to be contagious to one another. And then in verse 12, it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So just now I say, bitterness will manifest in every aspect of our life, including our prayer life. You know, when we are harboring bitterness, what do, actu what do we actually want? We want vengeance. We want to put people in their place. We want... We demand respect from people. And when our hearts are filled with such things, there is no room for Jesus to be in our hearts. There's no room for Christ. So we will not be able to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit because we are not interested in what God has to tell us, in how to become more like Him. And when the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, of our bitterness, but we choose to ignore it, so we begin to silence the voice of the Holy Spirit. And that is where prayer becomes lifeless. It is without the Spirit. And we begin to struggle to pray. And eventually what happens is we become like the people who are hostile to us. So we start treating others like the world does, with hostility, with aggression, to actually get what we want. So we do need to guard our hearts against bitterness. We need to be careful of how the world affects us we need to examine our hearts before the Lord and ask that He reveals any unforgiveness, any anger, any despair, any bitterness to be exposed so that we can deal with it in the presence of the Lord. And, and I'm going to end with this. Um, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to, to 48 tells us this in how we are supposed to respond towards the people around us. He said, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them to the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go a one mile, go with them two miles. Give to them, give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the, your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not pay, even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the gist is in verse 9 that we saw. Do not pay Repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because this, to this you were called so that you may, be, may inherit a blessing. So don't be like the world. Don't use people. Don't do things only for your gain. Don't only love the people that love you. Don't only be kind to the people who are nice to you. Be counterculture. Don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. But repay evil with blessing so that you who belong to Christ, you may inherit a blessing. And this blessing is actually, we will become like Jesus. You know, we will have a life of love and a life of freedom, 
a life that learns how to embrace suffering, and a life that patiently endures hardship with God's grace, a life that has learned how to depend on God. And I'm going to end with this story. Um, so some of you know this person, Corrie Ten Boom, right? She, is, she was a Dutch Christian living during World War II. So together with her family, she helped many Jewish people escape from the Nazis during the Holocaust. So eventually, she and her family got caught. They were sent to prison. Okay? They suffered terribly in the prison. So her father, her sister actually died uh, out of that. And when she was free, eventually, she, she actually began to start to travel around the world and preaching the gospel, including in Germany, the place that she has gone through intense persecution and suffering. So one day when she was preaching in Germany, she was preaching the gospel of forgiveness. A man walked towards her um, after the service and all, and immediately she recognized that man was a guard in her prison, the guard who had caused her a lot of suffering, guard who had been responsible, part of the responsibility of her, the death of her sister. So the man did not recognize her. The man had become a Christian. And the man came to tell her that he is very grateful of the message of Jesus who has washed away his sin. But in that moment, everything just came back. All the memories, all the bitterness, all the hurt just came back to her. And she was finding it very hard to, to say anything to the man, to shake his hand, to do anything. And she said a silent prayer to God. God, I cannot do this. I am filled with anger, but I need to forgive. And she just trusted that and she held her hand out to shake the man's hand. And at that point, she said, God just extraordinarily just filled her with his love. And that is where she knew she was free. And she was able to do that because she chose to forgive. She didn't feel like forgiving. She was able to do that because she chose to trust God. So she was free from her bondage. She chose not to hold on to her pain and her anger. And she chose to forgive, to love, even though she, inside she doesn't feel like it at all. And this is not just one occasion. It was because her resolve to do this every single day, to repay evil with blessing, including to those who have caused her so much pain. And this blessing that she received is she is able to love freely. She is able to love, live joyfully. She is able to go around and preach the gospel with conviction. And she is able to actually commune with Christ intimately. That is the, the blessing that we reap. That is the life that we will inherit, that we can enjoy despite the hostility that we face. If we choose to repay evil with blessing, if we choose to let God come and do something in our hearts. So let's look to God in prayer. I just want to encourage you to take some time to think about what has been just shared at this point, let's allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us, to reveal the things that we need to address. Let's not push away the voice of the Holy Spirit anymore. Let's just not silence it anymore. Sometimes we don't know what to do, but just coming to God and saying, Lord, I don't know what to do. I cannot do this with our own strength, but I need you and I trust you. Even uh, before we close the service, I do want you to think about what has been Share today thing and what we accumulate in our hearts can go a long way back 
and it can become a huge list uh, you know often when i speak to people and i've seen how people react uh, let's say someone had slighted you or insulted you and you are angry but sometimes the anger does not come from just that one occasion that anger goes back to the many things people have been saying to you throughout the years and all these things are stored up in your heart and the reaction is big and bitter and you throw all of it out again and again because of unresolved bitterness within the within the heart and so we must be mindful what the scripture is telling us in fact when peter quotes the psalm he's telling you know one thing that stops us from praying that stops us from hearing god is because there's just too many things in our heart that we don't want to listen to what god is saying we don't want to resolve these things and you all should do a, a check if there's so many people you're angry with if your list of people you can't forgive is long if there's so many insults or past things that you're extremely sensitive of because of what you have gone through then it's time for you to take a check and come before the lord and perhaps get someone to help you to resolve some of these matters rather than carrying it in the rest of your life and uh, this moment of length and, and fasting and prayer would be a good time to do so it's only through letting go we find peace with god and we allow to celebrate the goodness of god in our life so be mindful it's as simple as that one incident somebody accused you unfairly it can go both ways you can forgive and you can move on and find grace in god or you can keep that accusation in your heart and walk with fear and bitterness and anger for a very long time so this is what the lord invites us to deal with so let's come before the lord uh, we'll sing the song again none but jesus and look to the lord to fill our hearts even as the lord the holy spirit ministers to you just whatever it is in your heart just put it before the lord amen